Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited today to welcome back to the Innova Buzz podcast from Kofu City, Yamanashi, Yamanashi Prefecture, I've got to get that right, um, in Japan with a fabulous view of Mount Fuji. That's the important thing to remember. My friend Will Reed, who's Professor of Calligraphy and Kanji Culture at the International College of Liberal Arts in Japan. He's a lifelong student of samurai culture and author of a new book, Song of the Brush, Dance of the Ink, The Path to Self-Discovery Through Japanese Calligraphy. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Will. It's a great privilege to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen. And, and it's actually my second time on it. It's great to be back. That's right. Will, you previously appeared on episode 296 of the Innova Buzz podcast, and we were just having a conversation how much we should go into your background, your um, American heritage and birth, and and what is it, 30 or 40, no, 50 years in, in Japan. Yeah. Um, so what I plan to do is actually refer the listener back to episode 296 of the podcast and listen in to the story of how Will ended up where he is today in Japan. Today I really want to dig into the book Song of the Brush, Dance of the Ink, because it enables readers to appreciate the philosophical dimensions of calligraphy. And I've always been somebody that, admired calligraphy from the point of view of just art you know it looks great on the wall and and particularly the way it's presented in in japan where there's a whole lot of the whole environment around how it's presented is really important too and i'm sure we'll talk about that uh, but there's a lot more to calligraphy than just that beauty the artistic part of it and will in your book you you also give us a glimpse glimpse into your lifelong quest for learning through the practice of shodo, which is the way of the brush, the Japanese word for that. And I'm really excited to delve into that. So let, let's jump straight in. So why did you write the book now and how's it different from other books on calligraphy? Great. Well, they say that the height of the branches reflects the depth of the roots. <laughs> and you, you asked about my, my background. Uh, it gets longer every year I get older, but <laughs> somehow at some point you need to uh, kind of consolidate what you've learned. And the book was just a great way to do that. And this is actually the second uh, book that I've written on calligraphy. Uh, the first one was written in back in 89 and it's called Shodo, the Art of Coordinating Mind, Body and Brush. Uh, and it was time for an update. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's why I, I, I came to write the, that's one reason why I came to write this book, Song of the Brush, Dance of the Ink. And I find that, uh, that it's also a great way to honor the culture that I've been studying since I first came to Japan in 1972, 50 years ago, but also the teachers that I've uh, learned from along the way and continue to learn from. There's no greater way, I think, to honor them to, than to uh, get distill the essence of what the wisdom that they're providing, which is all in Japanese, mm. but to put that in English and make it available for uh, people around the world. Yeah, it's fascinating. I was reading a story, and I can't remember now whether it's actually in the book or it's in a blog post that you um, wrote associated with the book and it was the story and I can't remember the chap's name I'm really struggling with the the Japanese names but yeah. he was a samurai who had um who kind of he was second or third generation samurai but a lower level samurai and managed to build his status to the point where he had this massive influence in you know yes, the, the royal like court yeah, and, yeah and only lived for about 33 years because he um, got taken out by an assassin. Obviously, yes. um, people were... Uh... Well, he's, uh, he's sometimes known as the Renaissance Samurai. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was uh, born in uh, in the Tosa clan in Shikoku and in the lower, as a lower-ranking Samurai. But he had the um, this vast curiosity and sense of justice so the the Tokugawa uh, era, which had lasted for a couple hundred century, two centuries and a half, and it, it had gotten stale in some ways. And so he was one of the uh, group of samurai who wanted to overturn the Tokugawa government. 
And of course, that's partly why he then was taken out of assassins. Uh, but he he did some incredible things. I, they call him a Renaissance samurai because he was such a great learner. He would travel, take risks. He would negotiate, uh, you know, uh, peace treaties among, you know, clans that were at each other's throats. And he essentially, in effect, wrote the the basis of the new constitution that they were going to later then implement when the Meiji government came along. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating. He walked, he walked just massive uh, distances in his, in his short life. Yeah, I found that a fascinating story. But one of the things it highlights, and you know, this is core to the book, is the balance between the martial arts, the samurai culture, the... Uh, calligraphy, the the art of the brush, and how that all comes together. So, what what were some some of the challenges you faced in in your fifty years of study of this? And you know, I, I would say you're a master of this, but clearly, there's still a lot to learn. You're still um, you still have that thirst for learning and exploring this all together. But somebody like me who is still just at the stage of admiring the art and not even recognizing what the kanji characters actually say is, uh, has such a long way to go. What, what do you, what were some of the challenges you found along this journey? Well, one of the reasons I originally came to Japan, uh, one of the major motivations was to study Aikido, the martial art of Aikido. And at the same time I started studying calligraphy. And it turned out to be uh, a good match because they have a phrase called uh, Bumbu Ryodo, which means master of, lo of sword and letters. And the, the samurai originally were not expected to be specialists as today everyone wants to be a, a specialist. Mm -hmm. you, know, you go to medical school, you gotta be in school for eight years before you're even let out, right? And then you just do one thing. Well, in, in those days, uh, the Renaissance ideal of doing, being able to do many things was considered very important, but particularly uh, swordsmanship and calligraphy were considered to be uh, a best match uh, and, and because they cultivated the whole person. Mm. Uh, you, you, you had a sense of refinement and they would do tea ceremony as well. In fact, they talk about the five excellences of an Asian liberal arts education. This is one of my favorite uh, uh, phrases actually, and they are um, calligraphy, painting, poetry, uh, martial arts, and tea, or like as in tea ceremony. Mm. So those five things would all go together and they would uh, work to cultivate the whole person. Not just to be somebody who's incredibly strong with a sword and uh, can cut down many opponents, but the self-control is also considered uh, an important element. Yeah, the, I mean, I did, just reflecting there on the tea ceremonies that I've participated in, and I know you, you also run tea ceremonies online, virtual tea ceremonies, which uh, is a fascinating experience. And it's, when when you participate in one of those for the first time, you're thinking that it's kind of like okay, this will be like wine tasting or something like that, but it's actually um, it actually encapsulates what you've just said there. It's kind of like this whole self reflection piece, this going inside, this being at peace with yourself, and you know the whole experience is is quite amazing and it, it's just so complete. And drinking the tea is is only a small part of it. Yes. Well, the the tea ceremony, of course, has is associated with a lot of rituals. And if you're going to be a, become a, a teacher of that, you need to know those. But the, it was it received its greatest uh, advances as an art, and this includes poetry and the flower arranging and calligraphy and everything that goes with it during the uh, Sengoku Jidai or the period of the civil wars. Uh, so all the great tea masters. So, so they, while, while they're fighting, or the clans are fighting for to, who's going to rule Japan. This is when uh, the tea ceremony as a culture uh, received its greatest development. And many of the patrons were the uh, samurai warlords. So why would they go into a small space like that? Uh, a lot of people think, well, they just need to get away from the stress. But it was much more than that. Yeah. Uh, the first thing you do is you pay your respects to the calligraphy scroll not as an object, but literally as an embodiment of the person who painted it. So 
that calligraphy scroll, most people don't know this, that's actually considered to be the one of the an honored guest at the ceremony. Mm. So that's the first thing you do, even before the teacher, you bow to that scroll. Mm. And then they would receive political advice or, or spiritual advice from the tea master, who was also a, a Zen master. And I think that in our world today, uh, whereas now it might be more about business uh, competition rather than um, <coughs> fighting, uh, it, I think executives today need that kind of space to reflect on themselves and and the direction in their life. And, you know, to me, calligraphy is part of this, but it, I think it can provide that. Mm. Yeah, there's there's so much to be learned from some of these cultures and particularly in my mind that uh, everything is in balance everything kind of fits yeah. together and calligraphy seems to be at the center of, of most of these things is that how you see it oh you're gonna it's, it's interesting you say that yes just yesterday i spent most of the day working on uh, a piece for the, the upcoming exhibition and you you do it again and again and again and What's going through your mind is how you can balance all of these opposites. In other words, you, if you have two columns of calligraphy and there's a stroke that's extending in one side, you need a space to receive it on the other. If you have a very uh, wet stroke that is kind of a, um, uh, has a chromatic um, effect on the on, as the water spreads, the ink spreads, you need a dry stroke to contrast it. If you have a large character, you need a small one, and it's such a delicate balance. And you tr the, you're trying to get smaller and smaller in the appearance of the characters and at the same time, greater and greater power. And that whole mental process, just going through that for several hours, I, I was reflecting after I finished, I said, this is so much different from the modern urge to become bigger, better, faster. Mm. How you become more and more centered, more and more balanced and refined. And the traces on the paper is really a reflection of your mental and physical state at the moment you painted it. So you you then leave a, an impression of this that other people can visit vicariously. Yeah, and and you do a lot of work uh, for temples and for and I've seen videos of you. Basically, it looks like a huge broom that that you're painting some calligraphy that, that clearly is going yeah. to be um, hung up over over a very large area. So it's quite a big work. Well, that one that you're referring to uh, was actually, I painted a Zen, are you familiar with Zen koan? Uh, a koan is a meditation question that, uh, that the monks would focus on, which doesn't have an, a logical answer. The most yeah. common okay. one is what is the sound of one hand clapping? Mm. Or what is the, uh, what was your face before you were born. You know, there's no, there's no logical yeah, yeah. answer, but they would use this as a focus for meditation and then they'd have to demonstrate their understanding. And one of the famous koans is, is called, uh, go and, uh, have a cup of tea. That's the name, the title of it. And the story really briefly runs that, uh, uh, master Joshu is an old Chinese Zen master was visited by a, a, a young beginner who wanted to learn from him. And he says, have you been here before? And no, Master, I've first, this is my first time. Uh, please, I want to learn from you. He answers, go and have a cup of tea. And then shortly after, uh, one of the monks who's there every day and has been training with the Master for years asks, uh, uh, arrives, and he's asked him the same question. Have you been here before? <laughs> he says, Master, I, I, I'm with you every day. He says, well, go and have a cup of tea. <laughs> And then the third, uh, the person who was watching this, one of the disciples asks, Master, why is it that you ask the same question of the beginner and the veteran and give the same answer? What do you imagine his answer was to that comment? <laughs> Go, Go and, and have, have a cup of tea. tea. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole, the whole thing, I, it, it's a reference to going back to fundamentals, to basics mm. and getting back to the present moment and not, uh, becoming too abstract. And so what I painted was literally that the three characters meaning go and have a cup of tea. And it, we did more than, um, we, we actually, uh, had it, uh, framed in a, in a, by a, a very, very good, uh, framer. I don't know what you call them. They, this, he's been doing this for generations, like since the middle of the Edo period. 
And so we had a really nice uh, frame and uh, backing to it, and we dedicated it to the temple. So mm. that was a really nice uh, experience. Mm. And what fascinated me was I imagine it's really hard to control the brush strokes, and there's so much that goes into it. It's not just the pressure of the brush, but it's mm. it's or the pressure of the touch. It's... How, how how wide the ink spreads and and so many yeah, different yeah. aspects, and I imagine it's really complicated with the small brush and like um, just between your fingers, mm. and then to translate that into this big big yeah. brush <laughs> must be really it's, challenging as well. So what what are the what are some of the things that yeah. you have to consider when you're doing calligraphy to the level you are? Great question, Jurgen. Um, the the biggest challenge is that there are so many. It's like juggling. You've got you know how many balls in the air, and if you chase after one of them, you're going to drop all the others. Mm. So you might get the stroke quality right, and then the, the the size of the characters is wrong, or maybe it's well placed, but all the character, all the all the strokes are the same thickness, and so there's no sense of dynamics. There's so many things that are possible, so many balls that are possible to drop in the process. And one of the things that it does for you as you train is you learn to kind of let go of the specifics, but see the whole and also be aware of the details at the same time. So it's, it sounds like a contradiction, mm. but uh, it, it's, it means that you are able to, um, I guess juggling would be probably the fairest uh, comparison. But then uh, one of the challenges too is, you know, even if you get to the point where you practice, you can do it fairly well, now, what happens when somebody's watching you? Or like I've done a lot even on, for documentaries and on television, the television camera's on you and you don't know how it's going to come out exactly. Mm. You know, and, and so yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's another. The, that's the artwork part of it, right? Yeah, you're on stage, you know, and it's going to be recorded and you can't say, can I try that again? <laughs> and, and so what enabled me finally to over, because, you know, you're nervous and you, mm. you struggle at each stage. But what enabled me to finally break through there was I asked the uh, director of the particular documentary that I was on a, a series, I said, how many people are, well, he said, no, look at the camera, right? I was making comments and uh, it's a, the camera is bigger than my face. And, it, and he said, please look at the camera. I said, what else am I gonna look at? It's bigger than my face, right? And uh, then you have to say something. So I imagine I was talking to my sister in Michigan, uh, just, you know, it'd be more conversational. And then after we recorded that, I asked him how many people watch this thing because it was broadcast by satellite. He said, well, uh, we have monitors in, in, on all countries and continents, and we estimate we have about 100 million people watching it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now I just tell myself I have 100 million sisters, yeah. and I'm just speaking <laughs> to my sister. Or, you know, just, and that was one thing that helped. And another thing was to realize that it isn't just you painting. Obviously, you are painting. But it's it's a you're more like a member of an orchestra where you have the the craftsman who made the paper, and you have the the ink and the brush and all of that is part of it. And even the people watching, I, I get to the point now where I prefer if people are watching because I can kind of bring their energy into it and let's do this together. Mm -hmm. And then I I feel I mean I'm totally engaged, but I also feel partly like a spectator, and then excited about what's going to happen. And then also of course trying to maintain all of the the, the, the skills. And uh, the interesting thing, referring back to that uh, piece of go and have a cup of tea, was a huge, you know, it was uh, uh, probably the size of uh, much bigger than a tatami mat, maybe two tatami mats, right? And I'm standing above it, and as you say, it almost looked like a broom. It was a huge brush. But when I was painting it, I had the feeling that I was using a very small brush, and I was just mm -hmm. looking for the energy line, listening to the paper, letting it tell me. Now is the time to slow down. Now, how fast to go. It was almost like I was looking for directions from the elements that were part of the process. And then, you know, you're, you know, you just, you, you know, you're not thinking it, you're just so engaged in it and you finish and then, oh, it didn't come out badly, you know, because you have to get out of your own way. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I think there's, there's so much in that story that, is kind of a metaphor for, for business and for being present in the moment, being really connected to self and connected to the environment and using 
some of those elements of the environment. And I like how you've got hundreds of millions of sisters. So speaking <laughs> speaking to your very own sister, which for most people would be a fairly natural conversation. And yeah. so yeah. you can present yourself as somebody that is naturally conversational because you're yeah, well, take, having take this conversation. Team if, you're, if you're in a leadership position, you have a, you're an executive, you have a team, uh, you you know people are not going to respond well if you're trying to tell them what to do or if you have a, a an, if you're looking down on them or or interfering with their the way they do things but if you can sort, if you can emotionally connect to with them so that the conversation really is a group shared experience uh, that's got to be a better uh, team building mm. in itself it's a shift of awareness away from your, your ego or yourself or your body to more to the situation and to the people involved and uh, and then have, focusing on how to improve it. Mm. Absolutely. Now, part of the course you teach at the College of Liberal Arts is does involve calligraphy and you were showing me some things earlier. Well, first of all, just tell us about ah. the students at that university because okay, they're yes. not just in Japan, right? They're, they're all over. Right, right. Well, we, well, we, we uh, our, our university is uh, called the International College of Liberal Arts and it's located, we have a beautiful view of Mount Fuji. It's in our backyard practically. Uh, oh, it's pretty far away, but it's big enough that it looks like it's yeah. in the backyard. And we have, um, uh, I would say a third to half uh, are Japanese students, but uh, the rest come from as many as 40 different countries. Mm. And we, uh, all of our classes, except for the Japanese language class, of course, are taught in English. And that would include calligraphy and Aikido and everything else. So what I uh, f have found is particularly with calligraphy, which is, I would compare it to the difficulty of learning a, an in, a musical instrument, say violin or piano. Now imagine that you're gonna take a one semester course meeting twice a week for about an hour, 15 minutes, mm -hmm. So that's maybe 30 times that you meet if you if you <laughs> if you show up every day yeah. and maybe a little bit of practice time. So how how well do you think you could do with if that were a course in the violin at the end yeah. of that you're ready to give a recital? Yeah. Well, you know, you wouldn't really yeah, I much, right? doubt whether you'd um, come close to being <laughs> performing with one of the symphony orchestras. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well for, certainly that's for sure. But then. At the same time, you want to give the students uh, a feeling that they have made some progress. And, you know, you've heard the 10,000 hour rule. Mm. Uh, I think Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell, Gladwell yeah. did that. And uh, I calculated once, well, how long, he said that it takes 10,000 hours of deep practice to master something. So I calculated uh, how many hours you'd have to do if you wanted to achieve those 10,000 in one year. And it came out to like 27 hours a day of deep <laughs> practice. Well, that's not going to happen. That's just the practice. <laughs> yeah, just, just the practice. That's, and then uh, even in three years, it's nine hours a day. And then even in 10 years, it's three hours a day. Mm. And that, it's just you know, going to take a long, long time. But then I discovered a very interesting uh, TED Talk um, by Josh Kaufman. And he has a book by the same title called The First 20 Hours in which he had actually experimented uh, teaching himself uh, five different skills ranging from windsurfing to uh, programming a computer, playing the ukulele, <laughs> yoga routine, and, and, uh, uh, and the game of Go, you know, the, the, mm. the strategic game of Go, and in giving each 20 hours in one month. So he did little else, but he actually achieved a fairly decent uh, level uh, by focusing on the, the, the kernel of the learning principles and in effect, getting deep practice. So I was so inspired by this because I said, I, you know, my course is 30 hours. Yeah. Right. So, and, and it's, you know, they don't always show up. And, but anyway, at least there's going to be 20 hours in there. So I, I actually experimented with my, with my students. I reduced the uh, down to six essential lessons for how to control the brush. Just the stuff that I've been able to figure out or been taught over the years. And you're going to, I've been amazed. I can, um, share my screen briefly with you just to show you. And I, I realize that this might not be uh, possible to see on a podcast, but just to let you have an impression, uh, this was done uh, by uh, <clears throat> a, a Russian uh, student entirely learning online mm. uh, in just one semester. That's... And it's an eight character poem written in three different scripts with a small brush. Yeah. 
uh, and we won't go into the meaning and all that. I have to tell you, for those people that can't see it, who aren't watching the video, um, had you not told me this was a student that was really just a beginner and done a few hours of this, I would have said, wow, that's that I would hang that on my wall. That looks like a piece of art that control you know, the density yeah. of the strokes, the control of the strokes by the look of it and, and the layout, it just all looks fantastic. Even, yeah, even to keep the li- the alignment of the characters and the, the shape of the characters and the control, the concentration that this takes, it's just awesome. And uh, she's not the only one. Uh, she's maybe one of the best, but she's not the only one. Mm. I'll show you another just briefly. Uh, uh, girl from Finland who in literally before the semester was over in just 20 hours uh, had achieved uh, this. And, you know, uh, this is not only with Chinese characters, but with the Japanese uh, syllabary with an ancient script. Mm -hmm. And it's just, uh, I kind of uh, realized that if you really are concentrated, you have to be concentrated and you have to know the principles. I'll just give you one of them. Uh, that a lot of times people find the brush uh, is hard to control because uh, they're they put tension in the wrong part of their body. So uh, what happens uh, is they'll they'll tense up their face or their shoulders, and and that doesn't help at all. Right where you need tension, there's only one place you really need it, and that's in the palm of the wrist where you're holding it. In, in, in uh, not, not the wrist, the palm of the hand. And it's almost like squeezing a lemon. And when you do that, it kind of steadies and connects the nerves and, and improves your posture even so that you can make a straight line with these really fine tip control. That was just one of six that, that I also then ended up putting in my book. Yeah. And uh, this, I mean, I show this to Japanese people because these are, these are um, not Japanese people. They have no experience mm. with the brush, much less calligraphy or the language. And I show this to Japanese people and they say, oh, She's probably does it better than I do. And I said, well, I'd like to see what you can do because this is awesome. This yeah. is really, really good. And uh, it's not that that's the only reason you practice, but it's certainly nice. Well, for example, to appreciate classical, you know, to appreciate opera, right? Mm. You don't necessarily need to be able to speak Italian to, to, to appreciate and enjoy opera. It helps. Yeah. But it's only part of it, right? So I, I kind of make that analogy as well. But the idea that uh, it's a level playing field, and my Japanese students, they don't have an advantage. You'd think they would. Mm. But when it comes to, you know, working with the brush, we're all in the same uh, the same ring. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's definitely a lot to learn there. But that opera analogy is interesting, though, because it raises a question that I – started having a few times in reading your book and that's that a lot of the the stories that you relate to in the book historical stories or they might be uh, children's tales that clearly are part of Japanese culture and we in the west wouldn't have been exposed to that and yet Japanese people may have particularly the popular ones would have grown up with some of these stories and so to combine those stories and the meaning that goes into what then is produced with calligraphy, um, surely they would have some advantage there in terms of connecting connecting the deeper meaning and bringing that about. And I'm guessing you know, the, why the opera thing prompted it. If you think of um, any of the operas, I mean, there's a story that is usually behind it that upon which that opera is based. If you know that story, particularly the ones that are in your culture's folklore and you've grown up with those, you've heard about them since you were a child, the opera has a lot more meaning in in that particular example. The references, yeah, Hmm. the cultural references, and maybe even something in our genes, uh, because it is, you know, culture is partly inherited through our genes, I believe. But uh, you'd think they would have an advantage, but I have found that they don't. And I've, it's, it's troubled me at first. And I realized that a lot of them do not actually receive that kind of exposure as their, the two generations ago they might have. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, Miyamoto Musashi is a very famous samurai. And uh, I ask uh, college students, Japanese college students or Japanese high school students, I make a reference to Miyamoto Musashi and they say, who? You've never heard of him. <laughs> 
And 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 sometimes it's funny that sometimes they even think Musashi is a Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> there is apparently one named Musashi, but uh, so there is a there is a disconnect there, uh, which is kind of disturbing. But then also a lot of young Japanese are more interested in Western culture anyway, uh, and, and popular culture. So what I tell them to get around that and to reconnect the, to the cultural roots, as I say. If you want to be respected as a Japanese person, uh, speaking English is not going to do it. People speak English all around the world. Mm. That's that's not that's just your price of entry. You know, that gets you in the door. But they're going to be curious about your culture. And if you can't uh, both a, a explain it in English, and actually it's even better if you can demonstrate it, then you can call yourself an international person because you have roots in your own culture, but you're also connected to the world through the English language. And so I said, you want to do, you're studying in English? Well, let's show, show us what you know. Mm. And uh, that, that seems to really motivate them. And then, and then plus then they see they're, they're people from um, Uzbekistan or, uh, or uh, Chile or, you know, uh, Finland or Australia coming up with this awesome calligraphy and they're sitting next to them. It's oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little fire under them. You know? <laughs> yeah. How did you do that? You're not supposed to be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I've I've also found. I mean, those are people who are studying my course and they're they're going into a lot of depth. But I've we we have visitors sometimes because our school is quite famous for um, producing Olympic athletes and, and you know the the college that we're associated with, and so we've had visits from like rugby players uh, during the World Cup. And uh, I, they, they, you know, they're on campus and they want to have an ex cultural experience. They come to my class, and I've, I've found that even the, even the coach, and the players get so absorbed. I mean, I gave them a simple uh, set of characters, which meant all for one and one for all. Yeah. So it had a kind of a theme yeah. that they could relate to, and the the characters were not that difficult, but they were so engaged. And I asked them, well, you know, this is um, really interested as a, as a rugby player. Uh, because you think of these you know, big, tough guys mm. <laughs> crashing into each other. Uh, you're doing a pretty delicate bit of work here. What, how do you, would you see this could be valuable? And they said, well, in rugby, it's not just about, you know, clashing. You need to be really aware of space, spatial mm. conditions. And this is kind of an interesting exercise in, in spatial awareness. Mm. And then also we actually made a, um, a, a carved a signature seal for a, um, uh, Greg Laidlaw, who's a Scottish uh, rugby player who uh, was playing for a Japanese team, and the the meaning of the characters that we carved for him was bold but not reckless. Mm. So again, you have a even in sports, yeah. you have this play of opposites. You need to be bold. Obviously, you're not going to win if you can't. But if you're just bold, you're going to also <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah, that's right. It's but the you want to be isn't there, you, yeah. bold but not reckless. It's a great um, mm. phrase. Chinese philosophy, actually. Mm. Yeah, it's fantastic. All right, now who should be reading your book? Um, and just as a reminder, it's Song of the Brush, Dance of the Ink. Yeah, well, you know, the um, I would say that anyone interested in Japanese culture uh, or a view, a new view of Japanese culture, but I didn't write it as a how-to, uh, there mm. are how-to elements in it, but I didn't write it as a how-to manual so much as uh, a means of understanding how mindfulness was well, mindfulness is a very popular topic today. Mm. A lot of corporations will do seminars and training in mindfulness. But it, when I when I see what they're doing, it's the focus on your breath or live in the moment, and that's that's not bad. But it the is thing a little is, abstract, it's, isn't it? It's a little abstract, mm. and it's a, it, I don't think it goes that deep. But all of the Zen arts uh, are influenced by this idea of mindfulness and living in the moment, but there's another element to it, and that is that you actually uh, have to uh, engage through, well, for example, calligraphy or through martial arts or sword work, engage with a task that is really difficult to do, but it, it's highly influenced by your mental level, which is what you're, what you're polishing yeah. in the process. So the result in the art is, uh, is just a reflection of what's already happened inside. So I think that calligraphy is a, is actually once put into English, which is why I wrote the book in English, yeah. uh, becomes a quite accessible means of learning uh, mindful meditation. Mm. 
And even if you don't practice the art itself, just to be able to add that to your repertoire of understanding uh, Zen philosophy and being able to appreciate uh, calligraphy or ink painting. Uh, you know, uh, Jürgen, then back in 1954, uh, uh, Miles Davis did a, an album called Kind of Blue. It was the best selling album of all time, even today. And uh, on the album jacket, Bill Evans, uh, who's a pianist in that, in that, um, uh, at that session, uh, wrote uh, that the inspiration for their for that album was uh, Japanese ink painting, mm. delivering your full expression in the moment without being able to go back and erase anything. So the, to to them, the in Japanese ink painting, which would include calligraphy, was uh, a perfect metaphor for improvising and uh, harmonizing with your small team. Mm. I think that's so cool. It is <laughs> like, cool. Yeah, it is cool. And yeah. Uh, yeah, for those those people that are younger than us who may not know who Miles Davis is, um, go check it out. Listen to some of his work because it's pretty amazing. Um, it's yeah, the jazz definitely. era, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. What, so, what so was you're some... in answer to your question of who else would be interested, uh, I think anyone wanting to learn uh, Japanese language, of course, would be mm. interested. Uh, anyone wanting to visit Japan and getting, uh, maybe you can't as easily do so now, but uh, uh, ultimately the, uh, the the borders will open up and it will be easier to travel. So we're offering online virtual cultural experiences, which would not only be about calligraphy, but visiting places mm. and, but including, it's the, calligraphy in a way tells the story of the culture yeah. through proverbs and poetry. And so there's a whole lot of really interesting um, ways of thinking and ways of lifestyle and ways of understanding and connecting with nature that that are really expressed through calligraphy. So I think anyone interested in that whole Asian, particularly Japanese uh, view of uh, connecting with nature or Zen would certainly find something in the book. Mm. What were some of the lessons you learned in writing the book? Okay, well, it's not, it's not my first book. I've actually yeah. written more than 20, but uh, and including uh, two two books in Japanese that were both bestsellers. I mean, the, the publisher really did a good job of promoting them well. But uh, uh, what I found, uh, and I find every time, I think writing a book um, is probably the closest thing that a man can come to uh, experience of childbirth. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm just imagining yeah. what that's like, but... Uh, but it's painful. It's it's really painful, and and you have to be so, you, you have to cultivate the ideas and the seeds, and and you have to make sense of it. And of course, it's going to go through in front of a large audience, and you know eventually you have a an editor uh, and a copy editor look at it, so it will receive that polish. But if you haven't produced the uh, the the core um, uh, ideas and with enough clarity, the editor won't be able to improve it just by polishing the mm. the spelling and things like that, you know. So uh, that, uh, and, and then also for concentration and feeling of uh, the legacy, wanting to, because once it's in print, it's not that easy to change, right? Yeah. So it's, it's out there. But it's, uh, it's like you, it becomes your child. And then, so once the book is out, that's not the end of it either. You know, you, uh, you, you do online experiences and you, you keep learning, of course. This is why I made a blog mm. uh, called Song, Song of the Brush, uh, uh, dot uh, weebly dot com. It's on the Weebly platform, uh, but um, yeah, the I think the the book is just a, a a door opener for people who want to explore different elements that are in the book. Uh, let, let me give you just one example. Um, one of the things I write about is samurai signatures, mm. right? Samurai signatures because they had these beautiful look quite modern. Um, I'll just show you on the screen here. But I mean, some of these have, they look like uh, modern art yeah. sculptures or something like that, right? Well, uh, one of the things I introduced and I thought, well, you know, why not create characters that could for modern people based on their names? And so we have actually uh, designed, a, a, this is my signature, I'll just show you here. And it means uh, literally will or mission and then walk, to walk your mission or walk your willpower. And it's pronounced, uh, well, will and then walk means ayuma. So William, will ayuma means, sounds like William. Mm. So we, we're designing s signatures for people. And we've had a, 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 some 
people like executives who need to do signatures, you know, they need to sign things and they're on TV. And it's just a kind of a cool way to polish your identity. And that's just one example of where you can go deeply um, with something to personalize it for you. Mm -hmm. Or maybe gifts, you know, you want to, you want to customize or commission a gift for someone. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to engage with it. Mm. Fascinating. Yeah, lot, lots there, and I certainly encourage people to um, explore the book, explore the ideas in that, and, and look for the lessons that go beyond just um, what can we learn specifically that's related to calligraphy, because I think it, there's so much more and so much yeah. deeper. Yeah. Well, can I give you one just quick example of, sure. of such a lesson? Um, l let me ask you, uh, Jürgen, which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's an old question, yeah. right? And uh, you know, it's, it's like, like one of those then, ones that doesn't have an answer, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes, like, yeah. But uh, actually, there is a, a Zen phrase which describes a process in nature that I think provides the answer to that. It, it's called uh, sotaku doji in Japanese, but it means uh, it refers to the process where the chick, the chick, or, or the little embryo or inside the egg is not strong enough to break the shell from the inside, but it starts pecking around. And the mother bird listens to where that sound is and starts pecking back at the same spot. And when when the inside and outside t connect, that's what cracks the shell. And that's when the bird safely emerges from the uh, egg. And I think this is the way that we learn. You know, I you you you're you're pecking at the shell, trying to break through mm. to uh, a new level of skill or awareness. And you're you need a teacher, you need a sensei, who uh, if they're a good one, they will you know. If strike back right where you are, and then you make a breakthrough. So then you say, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, they came at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> they need each other, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, that's brilliant. That's, that's a brilliant that's, metaphor yeah, and, cool. yeah, sort of highlights that if if you're in the space of being the teacher, being in that role, to meet your students where they're at. Yeah, it, ah, I love that. Mm. Yeah, meet your students where they're at. You know, and of course, the student also needs to reach out. Mm. And uh, and and and, but I think a lot of people get encouraged. Like w when when you were in school, did you remember the teacher telling you to pay attention? <laughs> yeah, um, and you pretended to for a few yeah, minutes yeah. until you got caught again. <laughs> we all do that, right? Well, I the thing is, um, you can't do that in calligraphy. You can't fake it. It requires mm. hundred percent engagement. And engagement uh, is a, a rare commodity today. I, I was reading a Gallup poll thing that said that something like 66% of people worldwide are disengaged at work. Mm. And maybe as low as 15% are actually engaged. And that's that's horrible. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't people it? There's people that make our, you know, run our trains mm. and planes and make our cars and you know, make things work. And they're not even engaged in it. Mm. So we need a means of learning how to re-engage. Maybe it's difficult to do that right away with work, but if you understand the process mm. of how to concentrate and how to get passionately into something, you can transfer that and then uh, apply it to your uh, daily personal and professional life. Mm. Absolutely fascinating. Well, Will, I'm really enjoying this conversation. I think now would be a good time, though, to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. You've done this before, so we won't sure. um, compare your answers today to the last episode. I'll leave that to our listeners to do. Um, and we'll come back at the end of that and give people a link to the book and where they can purchase the book and where they can access that, that website that you mentioned earlier. So five questions and insightful answers to inspire the listener to go and do something awesome today. That's the idea. Great. What's the it. number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Uh, number one thing I would say would be to have fresh eyes, uh, a, a new perspective mm. on familiar things. Yeah, and look beyond the lines. I think that's one of the things that I'm sort of pulling out of of your book on calligraphy look beyond the lines look at the space as well yes yes mm. just all perception <laughs> <laughs> great oh. well what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas well what i always do is uh, a combination of walking and talking uh, mm. and sometimes at the same time you walk and talk meetings are apparently uh being used a lot by executives yeah. now and I, I try to walk every day. Uh, my goal is 8,000 steps. Um, sometimes I walk even a lot longer, but I think walking 
uh, gets the blood pumping, it gets us m m fresh air and sunshine, and that stimulates us much better than just sitting at a desk in a in a stale air room. <laughs> you know, we need mm. to get out and walk. And but why not talk at the same time? And you know, the uh, the various platforms available now make that possible. I talk to people around the world during my walks, and mm. sometimes I'll have the video on and show them where I'm going. And that's really a lot of. Uh, it's very stimulating. I always come back with new new ideas from that. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a great suggestion, and um, you just got to be a little careful. You don't trip on something when you're watching watching the other person <laughs> on the camera, right? <laughs> I don't I don't really watch them on the camera. I, I usually have the camera showing where I'm what I'm looking oh, at. Oh, okay, you know? yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> great. I, I must, yeah, I must safe. start to try that because um, I think it's a fabulous idea to say, hey, I'm I'm in this wonderful location. I thought of you. Um, just thought I'd have a chat while I'm walking and show you around. So we must do that because I want to see Mount Fuji on a lovely day. <laughs> of course, yeah. And then when you want to go face to face, you sit down on a bench where you're not going to get run over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Do you have a favorite resource you use most often? I mean, obviously calligraphy uh, brushes <laughs> and paper. Well, of course, that, that is, uh, <laughs> in terms of calligraphy, that would be the thing. But in terms of, um, for for generating ideas, I would say the mandala chart. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, um, yeah. It's basically an eight, a, a, a nine, three by three frame, and there's software that enables you to dig deeper under each frame uh, so that you can get as many as up to 64 different ways of looking at an idea. You have the idea in the center, you can get the bird's eye view, or you can drill down to the insect side view of the one of the squares, or you can see the connection of all. And actually, Otani Shohei, you know, uh, major league ball player, he used that to uh, design his, the goals. It's it's huge. He's he, I mean, of course, he's Japanese, and they love that he's a hero mm. <laughs> playing b baseball in, in the in the states. But uh, he used the mandala chart to kind of design his own training. Mm. That's fascinating. Yeah. 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 I introduced it on my on my website, uh, which uh, samurai-walk.com. But anyway, that, that's a tool I use mm. a lot. Yeah, it's it's a really fascinating tool. I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of mind mapping, and mind mapping sort of operates in a similar principle. Um, so I I can really relate to the Mandela chart. Mm. All right, what's the best way to keep a client or a student on track when when they're learning calligraphy, mm. for example? Yeah. Okay. Well, the, the, the question to ask is how do we get off track? And I think it's sometimes we set our goals so high or we assume uh, we overestimate what we can do. And then we find that we get distracted or too busy or, and we're not making any progress. You get frustrated and give up. So I, my advice would be to focus on gradual improvement with baby steps. Mm. Uh, the Japanese call it Kaizen yeah. where you're constantly refining the, the small steps and then after a period of time, it turns out to be something really, really good. Mm. Gradual improvement. Yeah, yeah. I'd... And focus on, on the before, after. The, what you know? What is the change that you can affect? Mm. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I love that philosophy. And I remember uh, that answer always reminds me of because we talked earlier about learning an instrument, and both of my children learnt um, piano and other instruments as well. But piano was their major instrument, and they actually learnt these massive piano concertos and performed them with symphony orchestra at the age of like eight and ten years old. And I oh. I was always amazed and astounded. There'd be this 30 or 40 minute piece of music and they'd have it in their head and perform <laughs> it out of their head. And, and, and I remember having a conversation with their piano teacher one day and I said, I just cannot for the life of me understand how they can remember this how they can learn this not just the notes and how the notes sound but but like the whole expression and the whole mm. flow of the piece that you know all the emotion and everything comes through and she said oh it's pretty simple it's like eating pizza you just have one little piece at a time eat, eat one little piece at a time <laughs> Yeah. And, was, and, and we've been talking for a better part of 45 minutes without once needing to refer to a dictionary. So, <laughs> I mean, it becomes, it's not just in your head, it's in your body. Mm. I mean, if it, it's a natural means of communication. If you do, if you take it a little piece at a time. Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. All right, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? 
Well, my my favorite uh, way is by finding ways to tell my story on different platforms. Mm. And there's so many available now. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of people on those platforms <laughs> yeah. telling their stories too. So to find the your signature story, mm. which is actually part of getting back to the Sidemark signatures, is something that's closely is connected to your name and identity and mission or passion in life that you can talk about and demonstrate. I think if you can do that, uh, even if somebody doesn't want to do the same thing, they might want to get pick up some of that energy or maybe pick up some tips that they can apply on in their own mm. um, field of endeavor. Yeah. And of course, you, so, yeah, you're one of those people who I really admire for bringing all the different interests you have and all the experiences that you've had that have been so wide and varied, bringing them all together and having everything kind of come together in this package and owning the whole thing, um, which <laughs> I think a lot of people struggle with bringing everything together and owning the whole package. And then that clearly would make them different. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of uh, paddling under the water, paddling like mad <laughs> yeah. so that you can cruise along the surface, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, I mean, that's nothing comes that easily, mm. but I think finding good, uh, good teachers and remaining uh, and just staying with it, you know, perseverance is power. Mm. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Well, this has been absolutely fabulous. I always enjoy our conversations, Will. Now, um, share with us again the link to your blog post about the book, but also to the, the book itself. Where can people get a hold of the book, okay. Song of the well, Brush, the, Dance the book, of the Ink? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, the book is available on um, uh, Barnes & Noble's website and on um, Amazon, of course. Uh, actually, it's already available on Kindle. It'll be out in bookstores on May 3rd. Uh, but available for preview and pre-order. Uh, so May, that's May 3rd the, is the launch of the physical the book? Yeah. book? of the physical yeah, book, but the yeah. the e-book's available before that. Yeah, yeah, it's already mm -hmm. available. And uh, you can, uh, that's the place to go for the book. And of course, um, it's best if you can buy it in a bookstore, but you might have to wait for that. <laughs> uh, and then uh, my website and the, and the place where I will also be um, providing ongoing um, access to backstories, uh, applications, and um, you know, interesting new developments related to the book would be through my website, which is S Samurai S A M U R A I hyphen Walk W A L K dot com, and the uh, blog of the uh, for the book is Song of the Brush dot Weebly that's W E E B L Y dot com. So that's where the ongoing updates uh, for just, for example, how my, how my brush caught fire. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that one. That, that's a, saw that one. That was fascinating. Story, flame, yeah. is, the, is it the Eagle's eye? Well, no, the dragon's, dragon's eye. eye. I mean, dragon's I was eye, painting, yeah. painting this, uh, this dedication for this, the shrine there. And suddenly I noticed smoke coming out of the bowl of ink and uh, from my brush specifically, the thing was on fire. The, the, the sunbeam had somehow focused on the plastic um, wrapping yeah. of the, uh, around the hairs. And uh, when I put out the smoke, it had the shape of a, a dragon's eye. <laughs> and so that became part of we the should... artwork that you did, right? <laughs> That's, they say the dragon's eye is the last thing that completes the painting. Yeah. So uh, even though I was painting the character for Tiger because it's the year of the tiger, but still <laughs> it, it came well, there's you know, a lot of fun experiences like that that yeah. I'm putting on the blog. Yeah, it's interesting. All right. Well, thanks. And we'll have links to all of those places in the show notes. So do you have Thank some you. parting advice for our listener today? Uh, I would say be a leading learner. Mm, I so love that. whatever you're whatever you're learning, you, you should and it, whether you're a teacher or, a, or, or a, uh, you have a team that you're leading or even your kids. You should learn 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times more and be continually learning. Mm. And, and then you'll have a lot more to share and people will, will pick up your uh, enthusiasm and, and then they'll take it in the direction that's appropriate for them. So I would say be a leading learner. Yeah, love that, be a leading learner, yeah. Excellent. And finally, who else should I get on this show and why? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, I, someone I've met recently and uh, connected very well with, his name is Andrew William. Uh, my first name is William, his last name is William. <laughs> and he lives in Kyoto. 
and he's a Zen uh, garden design. Well, he he started out as a garden designer, but he's then doing tours of of uh, Kyoto uh, Zen gardens, mm. uh, beautif- beautifully uh, done with video and narration. Uh, and his website is Anne is in Andrew is A N Design Kyoto dot com. Mm. Uh, he w- he would be a great person to connect with if you want some virtual experience, a virtual tour of the Kyoto that you may not know about. Yeah. Well, I haven't been. I haven't actually made it to Kyoto. It's been. It's always been somewhere where I've wanted to go on all my many trips to Japan for business, but I never managed to get all the way to Kyoto. And um, I guess I'm going to have to wait a little while. You, so connecting you, with Andrew and doing a virtual tour sounds yeah. <laughs> sounds like it might be a wonderful sort of short term alternative. And maybe we can even do something like that on on the show. Oh, that would be <laughs> awesome. Yes. All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights so generously with us today, Will. I've I've really enjoyed the conversation, as always, as I always do when we have conversations. And this one, of course, we're recording and sharing with my audience on an overbuzz. I certainly encourage people to get a hold of the book, Song of the Brush, Dance of the Ink, read through it. Let us know what you learn from, from the lessons there or what you pick up, because the lessons that I've taken away from reading the book, the lessons that Will wrote into the book may not be the only ones that are there. We see it through our own lens, right? And it would be really interesting to share with one another what what lessons we take out of the book and continue the conversation here. So I certainly encourage that. Rugby players yeah. have the, what they draw their lessons, and executives draw theirs. It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe we can even send it to some politicians and get them <laughs> get them to learn <laughs> some <needed>. lessons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, Will, and um, we'll definitely be staying in touch. So, all the best for the future. And thank you. You're yeah. such always such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Thanks again.